right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthy Nurse Connection, where we're making connections to improve the health and wellness of nurses. Today, we are talking with Kathleen Volman, who has been a nurse for a very long time. She's going to tell us her story, but I, I met her at a conference not too long ago, a caring for the caregiver conference, and I just felt like a lot of things that she had to say were just really inspiring, so I wanted her to come and join us today. So- Hi, and welcome to the Healthy Nurse Connection, where we are building connections to improve the health and wellness of nurses. I'm Leslie Catalano, your host, and I hope you enjoy today's show. Thank you. So good morning, Kathleen. Good morning. I'm excited to be with you. I'm excited to have you. So I just wanted to get started about like who you are and uh, what is your nursing story and just tell us about you. Well, um, so a- as you heard, my name is Kathleen Vollman. I've been a nurse for 43 years, um, 10 directly at the bedside in critical care, um, except for the first six months, because back in the early 80s, they didn't allow you to go directly into critical care. Um, so I spent six months on a very busy me- medical surgical area. But even in... Um, college um, in nursing school. I went to Wayne State University. I knew I wanted critical care. And I don't know if this happened to you, but um, they do courses by the alphabet, you know, to whether you're, um, you get to sign up first or last. And I'm Volman. So, and the year I was taking my elective, which I wanted it to be ICU, I was at the end of the scheduling not the beginning. And as a result, I didn't get an ICU elective. So I gathered about six or seven of my colleagues who also missed out on it. And we petitioned and we got a course. (laughs) So I I really knew what I wanted. (laughs) And then um, I went to grad school at Cal State Long Beach um, as a critical care clinical nurse specialist. And I worked 13 years at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, in the medical intensive care units as the CNS there. And then in 2003, I launched my own company, which is called Advancing Nursing, which, which is focused on creating empowered work environments for nurses through knowledge, skill, and process. So that's really where my passion lies is, um, helping nurses be able to do their best and do it with the knowledge, but also do it with the process um, within the environment to make it easy for them to do the right thing. Yeah. So that's interesting. So what have you guys been focusing on in the last few years? You know, because I feel like the work environment in the hospital has just been so it's so crazy. Like you say, you've been at the bedside for 10 years. I've also been at the bedside for 10 years. And I feel like that number of like nurses being able to sustain being at the bedside is getting shorter and shorter. I think we're at like two years now of nurses being able to stay at the bedside. Yeah, it's it's challenging. Um, I mean, especially post-COVID. Uh, and really what I'm working on now as a consultant with hospital systems is rebooting those work cultures. Um, refocusing on why we all got into this um, to improve patient outcomes, to help people. I mean, when I talk with nurses all over the world, that's the main reason why they got into the profession. And so it's really, how do we create environments where they're able to do that work and um, not spend the majority of their time connected to a computer? And so how, how, do, how do we get them to, to see the value and broaden the way they look at their advocacy role, their patient advocacy role? So what are you finding right now that is working and is helping? Or is it more just like an assessment period? It's, there's part assessment and also part um, reconnecting. Um, reconnecting with those roots of of why you you know why you ended up doing this and 
and really helping them see how in their work environment and in the work they do to find stronger meaning in it instead of just a bunch of tasks I have to accomplish by the end of my shift, really seeing it as critical interventions to prevent harm in my patient. And that I'm the only one that can do that. Yeah. Do you think it's difficult? Because I was just looking at some information today about all the new tasks that have fallen on nurses because we're short housekeeping, we're short respiratory therapy, we're short physical therapy, we're short OT. So like that to-do list gotten substantially longer and the available people to even help in the nursing field has gotten shorter. Like, what are you hearing or like, what are, what can they do about that? So they're not just focused on their to-do list. Well, the, the challenge, and by the way, just to let you know, I've been through this a number of times in my nursing career where the finances in the hospital are challenged. Um, So this is not just a people thing. It's also a financial thing where resources are cut and nobody's cutting bedside nurses, but they cut everything around us. Right. um, Which puts pressure on us. And this is where we have to stand up and, and speak uh, about the importance about what we do and that the outcomes for our patients are not going to happen if we don't have the right resources around us. And now a lot of a lot of the challenge right now is these are these are long-term issues that have been going on forever. And COVID brought it up into a significant crisis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I also see this as a time of finding um, finding new answers out of the chaos. There is a lot of national work going on to really focus on the significance of what we do as a profession and the direct outcomes we have as a result of that. And that when you mess with that equation, you harm patients. And if you if you push too much onto the nurse, I mean, there was um, it came out that that, you know they talked about really um, rechanging the EHR and reducing the burden of the documentation by 75% by 2025. They recognize, or at least I believe that's happening, the recognition of the burden that some of these systems have created for the nurse. In in And what I hear from nurses is I just want to be able to provide my patient care. It's- yeah, And I'm challenged with that because of all the extraneous um, components. But instead of sitting back and not doing anything, I encourage nurses to sit down with their upper leadership and say, okay, what is critical for documentation? What do we do during the pandemic? We reduced our documentation significantly during the pandemic. Did anything suffer? No, it didn't. Let's go back to that. And let's not use the EHR as our major auditing process. Because documentation doesn't necessarily mean care. Right. Yeah. And... There's many places that I go um, today that there's just this, they're auditing people to death. (laughs) Yes, I have felt that. (laughs) And the problem is, is they're not doing anything with the data. You're really only supposed to audit on things you have challenges with. And then you're supposed to create improvement plans and then you re-audit. You don't audit ad nauseum. (laughs) Right. 
So I, the other thing that I would ask frontline nurses, any nurses to do is to sit down and say, let's relook at the principles of quality improvement and auditing. You're not supposed to audit forever. You're supposed to audit, make a change, and then check it. And then let it go. And let it go after you are ensuring that the practice is present. It's working. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, yeah. So the main thing that you're saying is like, we can't just, we are working in hard times right now, but it's, it is up to us to have a voice to talk within our own system about how we can make the changes in our own area. Um, because I feel like sometimes too, we think like somebody has to fix this problem. So we're waiting for this knight in shining armor to come down and do no. like, you know, fix your ratios. We're going to do all this stuff, but that is not coming. No, and there is power. There is massive power in owning this at the unit level. And as a group, fixing it. So what, so I know there are hospitals, I worked at several hospitals that had like units, like UBCs, I think they were called unit-based councils, uh, who did kind of sit down and talk about these issues. But if you work in an area where there really is no support in that, or they don't have those type of councils, what would be like the first step for nurses to take? Create one. What is the likelihood that anybody in leadership is going to go, no, you can't meet to improve practice? So when you ask the question, we want to meet as a group, you you have to, like your background or your purpose has to be patient safety. Yeah, so, always. And quality. Patient safety and quality. Yeah, you're not, because if you meet, you don't have any power on staffing ratios right, right. now. Exactly. At the unit level. What you have power on is all the extraneous stuff. So give examples of extraneous stuff. So we talked about charting. What are some other things? Auditing. So auditing. The whole auditing process. Okay. Make your shift huddles more meaningful. Okay. Redesign them. So what? Ask, ask staff. Okay. Ask each other. What do we want to get out of these shift huddles? That's perfect. So like when you're going through your day and you're doing something that somebody has said this needs to be done and you're not finding value in it, then we need to question why is this, why do we need to do this? And sometimes people don't see a value in something because nobody gave them the why. So uh, for, for instance, all of the all of the caudy, the clapsy, the pressure injuries and the falls, it feels like it's coming from outside of our profession instead of inside our profession. So Florence Nightingale wrote, it may seem a strange principle to enunciate that the very first requirement in a hospital is to do the sick no harm. But when I ask the average nurse how they define their advocacy role, they talk about pushing up the chain of command to make sure the right thing happens for the patient, that they're the voice of the patient. But they don't see that turning a patient is a critical intervention to prevent harm. They don't see that ensuring the dressing on the central line is secured to prevent infection is part of their critical role in preventing harm and is part of their advocacy. So re, and, and by the way, this, this doesn't happen with one lecture. It doesn't happen with, it happens because you're working on changing the culture of the importance and value of nursing care. The kiss of death to all of this is saying, Joint Commission wants you to do this, yeah. or the government wants you to do this, or our 
administration wants us because we're not going to get reimbursed. Right. That is so the wrong way. Because all of these actions were put in place to reduce patient harm. So it's the core of why we're even nurses. It's the core of why we're nurses. Okay. And so if I if I look at it from an external perspective, I'm going to feel massive burden. Mm -hmm. But if I look at it from an internal perspective and an internal push of this is what I own as a professional registered nurse, then I'm going to think differently about accomplishing the care. That's very powerful. I felt like my own mind shift there. It's a, it's, and this is part of my mission <laughs> to, and part of it is, um, there's no better way to say this, but we've created a lot of learned helplessness. Explain that a little bit more. Basically this concept of, I can't do anything to change it. It's like a powerlessness. Yeah. It's just the way it is, and I just gotta suffer through it. And that's just unacceptable. Yeah. And by the way, that's unacceptable in life, let alone your workplace, because you always have choices. And one choice is to maintain the status quo and bitch about it. Right. The other is, I wanna do something about it. So we should be asking ourselves and our own work environments, one, what are we trying to accomplish when we're taking care of patients? Because I think we forget what the whole purpose of them being there and us being their nurse is. And then two, what is preventing you from being able to do that? So forget yeah. about the checklist that your manager is telling you. Forget about like the fall rate that they keep like putting on the wall saying you have to fix this. But when you're on your ship with your patients, you're, you should already be working towards no falling, no pressure. Well, and guess what? Then the fall rate is going to mean something. Yeah. Because you've made it a goal. The other challenge um, is that as nurses, um, with these particular components of our care, we don't see the harm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't. If, you, if your patient gets a UTI, you never hear about it. No. And so one of the things that I teach or share is this concept of doing immediate learn from a defects. So in other words, I find a pressure injury. I call everybody over and we go through it in four minutes, four mm -hmm. or five minutes. We see the patient that was harmed. Yeah. I didn't harm them. Our collective group, by being challenged with care, and we get to figure out what those pieces were, and as a group, fix it. Because right now, nurses get data in, uh, my, the worst form of it is graphs, usually hanging on a wall. I mean, that is so ineffective, but it's all percentages. It's not connected to a human being. So we don't connect that harm. Just think about what would happen if I got a call from the IP within 48 hours. This is likely, I'm 80% sure it's going to be a caudy. The whole staff do a learn from a defect. We find out what the issues were. We share that in shift huddle for the next 24 hours. Everybody knows that Mrs. Jones got a UTI or got a caudy, and these were potentially the risk factors. This is the action plan. And then up on the board, it goes from 245 days down to zero, and everybody knows why. Yeah. That's the best way to display data, because there's a pride in saying it's been 375 days since I got a collapsy. So when... Because burnout, you know, there's a lot of talk about burnout and it's, everybody's leaving the bedside. So when you are, or what words of advice do you have for that nurse who like goes to work, 
and just tries to do their absolute best every day. And they're just bogged down by all this other stuff that when they leave, they don't feel like they did a good job because they weren't able to do everything they were supposed to. That's when I, that's when I would talk with my peers and say, Hey guys, you know, and, and the local leadership and and say, and, and if I meet a wall, of changing. So I talk about the fact you got to bloom where you're planted. So if the environment is not nurturing and is every environment nurturing? No, but if the environment's open to change, that that's my barometer for leaving a position. Okay. That was my barometer in my career. If I could no longer affect change. Okay. Then it was time for me to go. Because I just remember when I hit burnout, um, which was probably a few years ago. I just remember like I would show up at work like, OK, I'm going to do this. It's going to be a good day. And then just leave completely drained. And I felt like I couldn't I just could not do what I wanted to do for my patients. Like it was literally just putting fires out 24 seven. And. I did have a conversation with leadership about how we were drowning. And what I heard was, well, our profits, we can't mess with our profit margins or it was something along those lines. <laughs> well, and, and so by the way, that may be not an environment to bloom where you're planted. <laughs> True. Um, and it it's because if, if you're fried, it's very difficult to give compassionate care. Very. I mean, that was part of that. I knew like the beginning of the end was when one of my patients complained to my manager that I wasn't like excited enough about their discharge that day. Like, I can't remember like what surgery they had, you know, but it was like a big moment for them to be able to go home. And I just, I mean, I was, you just needed to get it done. Yeah. I was just there to get to do my job, not to be in a celebratory mood with my patient. And they complained to my manager. <laughs> so what so what did you do to try and nurture yourself? Um, well, that's just when I decided I needed to do something different and I got into education because being a bedside nurse was no longer, it was just absolutely draining every time I went and like it was affecting my health as a whole. So all I could I just had to leave the bedside. And so I feel like there's a lot of nurses out there who are probably at that point. And so, well, and the key is, is how do you prevent yourself from getting to that point? Yeah. Because once you reach the burnt, you know, true burnout point, you do have to step away to, yeah. to regarner your nursing soul back. Right. So how do you prevent your soul from getting drained? And it, there's a number of things that we've talked about that you can do in the workplace, but there's also stuff outside of the workplace that you need to do in terms of sleep and exercise and eat healthy. What do you, um, what do, you do when but, you're feeling stressed out? Like What, what do I do? Yes. Uh, well, I don't get super stressed out anymore. <laughs> But then again, I'm also older, <laughs> so I've developed coping patterns, but I have something. So I travel a lot on my business with my business, but I have something called my A team. Okay. I have a, a, I have a chiropractor, I have a energy masseuse and an acupuncturist. <laughs> wow. And they, besides my regular Western medicine component, yeah. those are the things I do to help um, ensure my body's and my mind is in the best spot. I also open my day with prayers, just short little prayers um, as a part of that. I also spend time with family and friends. And every once in a while, actually probably more than once in a while, a good bottle of wine with friends or family <laughs> um, and laughing. Yeah. 
Do and you? I also make sure I take, I, I take the time off. Yeah. Did you have those, like when you were a bedside nurse, did you have those like stress management skills already in place? I, I got to tell you something. I, I made a promise to myself never to do overtime. And yeah. the only, and the only time I did overtime was two snow emergencies where I was mandated to do overtime. Yeah. Because I knew how tough the job was. Yes. And when I entered into my CNS role and the environment was extremely challenging, I took a vacation every three months. And then when I started publicly speaking, my first national presentation in 1992, after that, I recognized that sharing my knowledge was a soul fulfilling yes. activity. And so I didn't need those vacations anymore. I just needed regular vacations. So when but you're I've, a nurse in a stressful environment, you did not work overtime. I feel like so many times we're asked to work overtime and it's really hard to say no. So we don't like to say no. Well, and that's the guilt thing. Yeah. And I grew up Catholic, so I have a fair amount of that. And I just made a promise to myself. Yeah. So everybody needs to make their, themselves that promise. Yeah. And I know some people can't because they financially need to address whatever. But the other piece is I was, you know, I was single. Um, and I also lived within the money that I made. Right. Without any overtime. Yeah. And I did that on purpose because I love nursing and I didn't want to not love nursing. Right. Yeah, I do feel that because um, nursing became even harder because when I was single, you know, I could do night shifts, I could do overtime, I could do it all. But when I started my family and I had a husband and then I had kids, like it took even more of a toll because you spend all your energy at work. And then when you get home, there's more people that need more of your energy. And so well, and you and you've got to figure out a way to balance that. Right. And by the way, that exists in any job. Right. For a woman. Yes. <laughs> Just to be perfectly honest. Yes. Because they're they've got a full time job at work and a full time job at home. Yeah. So trying to find that time. Cause I really just went through this exercise with myself the other day. Cause I still, I still, I do still tend to commit to too much in my life. That's just Well, and, and the other piece is, is we all have a bit of that um, perfectionist bug. Mm -hmm. It sort of enters the, the people that enter nursing have, <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> it's just something that exists. And so we have to lower some of those expectations. Yeah. So we're not so hard on ourselves. Yeah. But I, I really had to write down, like, if I was going to do something for myself, like, what does that even mean? Because a lot of times I, I'll say, okay, I'm going to set this aside, <clears throat> excuse me, set some time aside for myself. And then somebody will come up, a child and, you know, in my family and be like, um, can you help me with this? And then I start to do that instead of doing what I was going to do. So I really had to like write down because sometimes it's okay and I enjoy that, but I really had to like write down like what is it, what activities bring me joy and what don't so that like I can include my family in some of those because it's joy for all of us. But then some are just, you know, like sitting down and doing homework, math homework with my eight-year-old is not fun. <laughs> that would not bring me joy. Math is not my favorite either. No, I, I could do geography and I'd have fun with that. But math, no. But going to the library or reading the book is something that does fill me up and, you know, fills them up as well. So try to find those activities that kind of do both. But then still, well, go ahead. But, but part of that is knowing yourself. So that's a big part of all of this. Yeah. Is knowing yourself, knowing what drives you, what triggers you. Um, and I remember I, I literally, 
I don't even know if it was a post-it note. I don't know if they were around yet. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that old. But I remember having a note in my desk at work um, that said, just say no. <laughs> yeah. It's hard sometimes though. I don't know why. Well, and so one of the other journey that I took, um, and it was a big one in self-development, um, was creating a personal mission statement and knowing, knowing what that is really helped me say yes or no to things. Yeah. So is it following the goals for your life or is it putting up a barrier to that? That's right. I, I mean, does it, does it add? Yeah. Interesting. Because you're going to get things that come up in your path in life. Yeah. Um, and it seems good, but is it going to, is it going to fill your soul? Yeah. Yeah. One thing I remember from when I heard you speak, uh, I think it was in May, is you had an elevator speech that was like design. And so going back to like, why do people go into nursing or what is nursing? Uh, when somebody asks you, what do you do? I want you to tell everybody what your elevator speech is. Well, so one of the things I do know is I'm not licensed to cure disease. And so when I look at what it is I own, that's where my elevator speech comes from. And what I do own is helping people, people feel better or function better, whether they have that disease or not. And you can apply that. And by the way, then I get to the third floor and I can go ding because sometimes and get out. Sometimes you're asked, what do you do for a living? And you say, I'm a nurse. And then they ask, well, what do you do? Yeah. And you try in a very concise way to say it, but it's hard. But really, that's what I and it comes off of Florence Nightingale. Yeah. You know, that's where it stems from. But I, I that's really what I do. And I they don't feel good if they're in pain. They don't feel good if they have a pressure injury. They don't function if they spend too much time in bed. They don't function well if they end up getting a pneumonia because I didn't clean their mouth. Yeah. So our job is not the long laundry list of things that we have to do, like passing meds, charting, all those things. It's literally trying to make someone feel better. Feel better and function better. Okay. Not just feel better, but function better. Perfect. Um, so... I love that. I love this conversation because you've really kind of made me think about all of this in different ways. Um, part of the reason I started this podcast and wanting to share information is because that fills my soul. So I found something like within nursing that still fills my soul. Um, but what else, like if somebody wanted to, like, do you have a website or do you do anything with nurses or do you really just work on the hospital side? Yeah. No, oh, no. I um, so I do a fair amount of uh, professional growth seminar work. Um, I also work um, to with startup companies that are making products that um, make the life of the nurse easier and achieve the patient outcome, um, because that's part of the equation. The value piece I build, the skill and knowledge I build, and then I look at the resource and system to make it easy for the nurse to be able to do the care. And so I have a website. It's just my last name, www.volman.com. So it's pretty easy to find me. And it talks about um, the presentations that I give, um, as well as the consultations that, that I do. Um, so professional, a lot of um, chapters, uh, American Association of Critical Care Nurse Chapters, have me come in, um, as well as um, infection preventionists and WOCNs, because all of that's fundamental nursing care. Yeah, amazing. Well, is there anything else that you would like to say or any other words of wisdom? 
Well, the other thing, and we didn't we didn't end up talking about it, but um, I did invent a product. <laughs> right. Yes. Tell us about your product because you, if you have an idea, you can. That's right. You can take it to fruition. So um, it was something I thought about in the early eighties. Um, there was a physician. So this is where something simple can lead to something amazing in your life. Um, he put an article um, on the back table about turning ARDS patients um, prone. And um, our ARDS patients back then had about a 70% mortality rate. And so there were a group of us on the night shift that decided to just try it. <laughs> and we saw the benefit of the improved oxygenation. And so that got me thinking. And then I looked and the only way to prone somebody was, um, and many of you will probably not know this, a circle electric bed. You can look it up on Google um, or uh, a striker frame. And so I knew that using this position would be difficult unless there was an easy way to make it happen. So I started that journey and I developed it. Um, in grad school and did a patent in 89. Um, I was ahead of my time. It didn't go on the market until 1997. But it, but what it did is expose me to so many different clinical environments. And um, it also expanded my reach around the world to nurses. Yeah not just in the United States. So even though, uh, you know, there was some financial, but it wasn't huge. Um, it was a huge life journey that brought me a lot of joy. That's awesome. Yeah. And so I asked nurses, don't give away your ideas. <laughs> really think, and by the way, there are um, many individuals. So that's one of the things I do is I, nurses contact me if they've got an idea and I get them started on the process. That's amazing. So if you have any ideas of how you can improve patient care, then uh, Kathleen Bowman is a woman. And then you have passion about it. You want to make it happen. Yeah. Okay. And there's now innovation, nursing innovation labs and things like that. So there's a lot more around than when I started my journey. That's awesome. It's so awesome. that's what's so exciting about the field is you can pretty much do anything. Yes. That's another thing too, I think to say is that nursing is more than just the bedside. Like nurses are needed at the bedside. We are the foundation that um, runs the healthcare industry, but there is more beyond the bedside as well. And I think sometimes we forget that. So if you feel like you need to change, it doesn't mean you have to change your whole entire career. No. Just find that thing that brings you passion. And then I've also found too that following this other passion has brought me back to appreciating the bedside. Like, yes. So if you can, you know, if, if you find something, I just happen to find this extra passion with public speaking and sharing knowledge. Um, but other people find it um, rejuvenation of their soul through gardening. Yeah. And that gives them enough love because we give all the time. Right. We have to make sure that we take as well. Yeah. So gardening, being out in nature, whatever it is, volunteering at a local, whatever, just whatever it, yeah, whatever brings you your soul back is. You know, yeah. Whatever rocks your socks. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kathleen, it was a uh, wonderful talking with you. And thank you so much for joining me. Well, I want to thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it was wonderful. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, this was a great conversation. I learned a lot in just a few short minutes that we were together. Okay. Well, have a wonderful day. And hopefully some of you out there contact me. <laughs> yes. And I'll put your um, your website and your information in the show notes too. Awesome. Right. Right. Thank okay. you. Okay.